Good afternoon. I'm Aaron Klein, a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, and it's my job on behalf of the Center of Market Regulation and Markets to welcome you to this interesting fireside chat that we're going to have here on the future of stable coins. And, you know, sometimes in this uh, policy and event in public planning world, it's better to be lucky than good. And we set out to have this conversation several weeks ago with Jeremy Allaire, the CEO and co-founder of Circle, which is the second largest stablecoin uh, issuer uh, in, the, in the world. And when we set this up a couple of weeks ago, we knew that there was a lot of conversation happening in Washington uh, as it related to future regulation of stablecoins. This had, this had been a priority of the president's working group on financial markets. Uh, but we had no idea that yesterday, in fact, the PWG, as it's called, uh, which is the uh, Treasury Secretary, the chair of the Federal Reserve, the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, chair of the CFTC, and joined in this instance by the comptroller of the currency and the chair of the FDIC, would all issue a giant report focused solely on stable coins just yesterday. And that is really the lead issue. And I want to delve right into this with Jeremy, uh, who, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. I should note, in addition to co-founding Circle in 2013, that was after you'd already taken uh, another company that you'd founded public on the NASDAQ exchange. You'd come as a veteran, not just of financial technology, but of building a business and, and an enterprise. Um, and you know, we'll get into what stable coins are and why they've blown up and why they're attracting all this attention. But I want to delve right into the meat of the question here, which is that just yesterday, the president's working group on financial uh, markets issued a large report dedicated solely to stable coins. And they had three main recommendations. And I'm going to ask you to respond to each of the three. Uh, and let me read them to you. Uh, first one, quote, to address risks to stablecoin users and guard against stablecoin runs, legislation should require stablecoin issuers to be insured depository institutions, which are subject to appropriate supervision and regulation at the depository institution and the holding company level, end quote. Do you agree with this? Do you think that stablecoin issuers should become, in essence, banks subject to bank-like supervision and, and regulation? So we do, in fact. And in fact, multiple months ago, we announced that we were preparing to file an application with the OCC for a national commercial bank charter with Fed supervision and FDIC insurance. And specifically with the goal of establishing the first uh, national full reserve digital currency bank in the United States. Uh, and, and that remains our intention. And, and it's good that it's aligned with how the Fed and Treasury and others are thinking about this. And I, I think um, that that's my, my very quick answer. I think um, at, at a high level, of course, and we can get into this in, in subsequent parts of the conversation, there are many types of stable coins in the market today. Um, I think in particular, which is I think the focus of this report, asset backed dollar denominated, uh, aiming to be dollar payment system stable coins um, really belong at the federal level and really belong under that kind of banking and payment systems regulatory framework that we have. Now, clearly, and this is, I think, uh, one of the reasons why they've asked Congress uh, to, to become involved here is that there's a lot of novelty, uh, and maybe novelty is not the right word. There are a lot of significant differences in the way this technology for money works uh, from prior um, banking and payment system technologies. And so there's a lot to work through in terms of building the statutes that would provide the right set of tools uh, to the Fed or Treasury or others to actually supervise a national scale, if not international scale, stablecoin issuer such as Circle. So we're supportive of that recommendation. Uh, again, there's there's a, a lot of, of devil in the details, obviously, uh, but behind that, and and, um, and and there's a lot of I think significant issues, uh, some of which are noted uh, in, in the report as well about. Um, you know, what a, a full reserve dollar digital currency model like this uh, looks like, what are the risks, 
how does this interact with the public internet and related technology? So there's a, there's a lot there, but I think at a high level, uh, we, we do think that. And, and, and maybe just as a final comment on this topic, and, and I'm happy to drill into any detail, is you know, when, when we started this project um, and, we, uh, and we launched this over three years ago, you know, we worked with banking regulators, payment system regulators uh, throughout the country to build a product that worked within the fintech laboratories of the United States, which today are at the state level. Uh, PayPal, Square, Apple Pay, uh, so many innovations that we take for granted in terms of digital money have really been in that fintech laboratory of state banking supervisors. And so we've had, I think, good regulators. We have a framework around money transmission technologies. Um, and I think that was really the appropriate uh, place to start. And that is how we're regulated today. But as these go from, you know, 30 billion to 100 billion to 500 billion in circulation support potentially tens of trillions of dollars of transaction value and become embedded in not just financial market activity, but deeper in the real economy and commerce, I think the stakes are a lot higher. And I think that's part of what you see in the report is a recognition that these technologies based on network effects, user bases, other things can grow really, really fast. Like other things like messaging apps grew really fast or, or transportation systems like Uber grew really, really fast. And I th so I think there's a recognition of, you know, this could happen really quickly. And, and if, the, if that did, it could really have an impact on the financial system and the real world economy. And so let's get out ahead of that. And so I think in some ways we're seeing um, a desire to kind of upgrade from the fintech laboratories of the states to the federal level in a technology as fundamental as stable points. So, so I think as I read the report, uh, you could be a state chartered bank or a federally chartered bank and issue an IDI under the Treasury's proposed legislative framework. You could not be a credit union. So it's not really all insured depository institutions. It's really all banks and thrifts because then your holding company would be regulated by the Federal Reserve, right. which would then be empowered to put in separations between banking and commerce, which get to the core of the second recommendation that I'd like you to respond to. So I have you down as yes, in agreement with recommendation number one, uh, become a bank. Uh, two, this is the PWG report and I quote, to address concerns about payment system risk, in addition to the requirements for stable coin issuers, Legislation should require custodial wallet providers to be subject to appropriate federal oversight. Congress should also provide that the federal supervisor of a stablecoin issuer with the authority to require any entity that performs activities that are critical to the functioning of the stablecoin arrangement to meet appropriate risk management standards. End quote. Agree or disagree? I think there's components of that that I think may make sense. And I think there's components that are very problematic. And I, I think um, part of this really, um, you know, kind of connects to the, the nature of this technical innovation. So what's extraordinarily powerful about digital currencies like USDC and stable coins as we talk about them is that they exist on the public internet. And you know, the, the underlying infrastructure that they're built on top of these blockchains are basically operating systems that exist on the public internet. And they're operating systems that are not centrally managed and controlled. So when you think about um, you know, operating systems today, like you have an operating system on your phone, you have an operating system on your, on your desktop computer, as a business, you might put your software out in a cloud provider like an Amazon and, and host host your software with operating systems there. Blockchains are like a new operating system on the internet and they're, and they're um, designed to be extraordinarily tamper resistant, resilient, decentralized, much like the internet was designed to be this resilient decentralized infrastructure. Now that technology, when you connect something like a dollar digital currency to it, it, it means that that digital currency kind of exists everywhere that the internet exists. And like the open internet, which today is, you know, I think the power of the open internet is something that we all take for granted. It's the air we breathe, which is that 
anyone can connect a device to the internet and kind of connect to any other device on the internet and, 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 do, and, and conduct a, an incredible array of activities. These public blockchain networks provide this, these operating systems and economic infrastructure for an in, incredible amount of interactions. Now, if you take something like a stablecoin and you put it on that infrastructure, the power is the open network. The fact that uh, software makers, hardware makers, um, regulated financial intermediaries all around the world can connect to these stablecoin protocols um, is, is a, an enormous amount of the value. It's what makes it possible for a digital currency like USDC for someone to settle a transaction at the speed of the internet with the reach of the internet at a fraction of a cent. And I, I think to, to, to use an overused phrase, uh, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so in, in a scenario where you say, well, any you know, wallet that a, an intermediary is responsible for uh, should be under like the Fed supervision. I mean, it's sort of like saying anyone who want, wants to you know, run a mail server should be under the FCC's supervision. And that is sort of patently absurd to us today. But I think if you went back in time to when the Telecommunications Act was getting passed and when people are thinking about what licenses look like to perform, say, communications activity, I think um, there was sort of the, we have this structure of supervision that is very country specific, very domain specific, but the open internet kind of created a, a different set of expectations and capabilities. So I think though, um, so I, I think that that's challenging. And I think it's challenging with how this works today and, and, and cuts against the grain of sort of the fundamental value proposition and innovation here. Now, I, I guess what I would look for is um, really to, I think probably underneath that, uh, that goal or that, or that suggestion is a set of concerns. And, um, and, and, and how do you address those concerns? So, you know, in the United States today, for example, um, we have treasury rules for firms that are involved in being custodians of, ver of convertible virtual currencies. Uh, those are treasury department rules. If you are a custodial wallet in the United States, you must register with FinCEN. You must have a BSA AML program. You must conduct KYC. You must do transaction monitoring and all these sorts of- Those are a series of anti-money laundering laws and regulations enforced by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN. Keep going, I just wanna- that, That's right. And, and I think if you're, if you're providing that as a service to institutions or individuals, you may uh, find yourself as a, a regulated money transmitter and therefore also have legal obligations to register with banking regulators throughout the United States and register and be supervised and be licensed. And so we have a structure today which requires custodial wallets to be regulated they were regulated at the federal level by the by FinCEN and IRS, and they're regulated at the state level as well. And so there is regulation there, I think, um, and, and that's effective. Now, if what they're getting at is they're saying custodial wallets, you know, that there should be some national license for that, that is separate from the money transmission statutes that we have today. That's a discussion to have. Um, and, and so, but, but I think that the notion, the, the deeper notion here, which is in, in, in the comment that every entity that is involved in it should be, you know, subject to sort of indirect supervision or direct supervision, etc. I think that's very, very challenging. Um, that's like, you know, sort of saying, you know, um, I'll give it, I'll give a real world example. Um, most uh, consumer banking today happens through mobile apps and through web applications on computers. And underneath that, uh, there's a lot of pieces of the ecosystem, right? There's internet service providers. There's, uh, you know, th th there are companies that uh, run web hosting. There are companies that issue digital certificates for securing the websites. There are you know, so many technology components to delivering that. But 
no one is suggesting that like the Fed should supervise ISPs because banking is delivered through 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 internet software. And so I think the same thing here. We have to really figure out what are we really talking about here? We're we talking about financial intermediaries and their conduct, or are we talking about uh, pieces of the technology architecture? Well, Let's, let's drill into that, because I think what they're saying is that, essentially, to use your example, the federal regulators are empowered to look at third-party vendor management. And the, the exact line that the PWG says, to meet appropriate risk management standards. So it's not that the bank regulator goes into the web host yeah. or goes into the third-party provider. Sure. But that if you're vending services to a bank that are critical to that bank's operation, then the regulator has the authority to make sure that you as the, the, the critical intermediary provider are meeting appropriate risk management standards. Your system isn't going to have an outage. Yeah. So I think, I think conceptually that all makes sense, right? So we, we, we run, you know, fairly just as a company, right? Fairly significant enterprise risk management, information security management, and as a regulated firm have various, you know, cyber uh, requirements and, and so on. I think the tricky part here is, is, is really the, the fact that digital currencies like stable coins run on the public internet. They depend on the public internet. They depend on public infrastructure that is not operated by any company. It's not mm. operated by any government. Just like the internet itself is not operated by a country or a government. And it's the first time ever that fundamental economic and financial infrastructure is actually outsourced to the internet, to decentralized infrastructure on the internet. That's not something that, you know, the, you know, CPMI or, or PFMI standards, you know, these, these international kind of um, standards for payment market infrastructure or other things have ever contemplated. They've just never contemplated the fact that you could have, um, you know, direct peer-to-peer -peer value exchange over a public internet infrastructure. And, and so I, my own view is, I think this is the, the ultimately, right, we're, we're we're, we're thinking about resilience, risk management, infrastructure security, reliability. And I think um, this is a process where banking regulators in particular um, and, and, and the standards, the enterprise risk standards that they expect will need to come up with a, a, an approach to financial institutions that are interacting with these public networks. It's no different than saying I'm a bank that's going to provide a way for my customers to store and transmit Bitcoin. It's the exact same issue, right? Um, well, who runs the Bitcoin network? Well, a, a decentralized network of miners run the Bitcoin network. Well, how do we supervise them? We, well, you can't supervise them. So it's the same kind of issue. So, so let, me, let me say that because uh, Niha Narula, who's an a expert on this at MIT and is integrally involved with some of the constructing that's occurring upon the Federal Reserve's potential to create a central bank digital currency. She wrote on a recent piece, quote, the blockchain itself might be at risk if a stable coin which runs on it becomes too big, especially compared to the monetary base of the blockchain's native token. Stable coin providers can have influence on the blockchain's governance by only honoring the version of the stable coin on one side of a blockchain fork, for example, even if it's not the side that most blockchain users prefer. Or a stablecoin issuer could choose to honor tokens on either side in different ways. She goes on to list other examples. Uh, you know, how would you respond to Nia's concern about this very blockchain nature that you raise as a reason why the regulatory structure proposed by the PWJ, PWG may be problematic? She's pointing out that that very structure creates opportunities for a stablecoin issuer to engage in a way that, that, that could require greater supervision and regulation. What would be your response to Niha? Yeah, I, I know Niha well, I've known her for a very long time. And um, she, she's an extraordinarily uh, bright and, and thoughtful. And I know she's, she's obviously thinking about new kind of um, crypto money transaction architectures for the Fed as well. So um, I, I think, um, you, you know, again, coming back to 
uh, the, the analogy, and I, I actually think it's more than analogy, I think it's more almost factual that blockchains are like operating systems. And there's a lot of intense competition for these new internet operating systems. And, and these new internet operating systems are usable for many, many types of applications. A stablecoin is one application that you can build on one of these operating systems. There are games, there are social networks, there are other fiduciary applications, there are commerce applications, there are digital intellectual property applications. There are so many different applications and we haven't even thought of the 500 that haven't even been come up with, that, that have not yet been you know, developed. So really important infrastructure um, and, and is, is a, the web three kind of concept, this new infrastructure layer of the, of the internet is what we're building on. Now, we have chosen to take a multi blockchain approach because there is this competition. And my, my sort of philosophy and our philosophy has been, if you have a protocol for dollars on the internet, like USDC, that you want your digital dollars to be cross-platform. It would be like saying you can only use your music on an Apple device. You want to be able to you know, use your media or, or conduct your communications, whether you're on a personal computer, uh, on a web browser, on, a, on an Apple device, on a Sony device, whatever that is. You want, you want cross-platform. It's a concept that I think consumers intuitively understand today. And I think the same thing holds for digital money and for digital currency. And so being multi-blockchain is essentially the, the, that kind of being multi-platform. Now, it may be, and I think it would be totally appropriate for, you know, when, when a stablecoin becomes um, very large in terms of its role in economic activity to sort of say, there's a whole series of requirements for what are um, deemed to be um, kind of acceptable public network infrastructures to run on top of. Uh, or if there are newer public infrastructures that emerge that are, are supported, that you've got very ro robust risk management standards around issues that could occur, resolution, other things. So I think there's a lot of work to do. As I like to say, you know, there's no OCC exam manual for running a digital currency on a blockchain in a bank. Well, there's going to have to be. We're going to have to come up with that exam manual. We're going to have to come up with how, how to deal with those scenarios. And the answer can't just be it's open to the market. This, these are market conduct issues. Th these are, these are you know, risk issues. And so I, I'm actually, ultimately, I'm encouraged because I think part of what you're seeing reflected in the PWG report is an understanding that this is a new architecture for money. And that this is a new financial market architecture. And the answer is not just slam it into the old one. It's actually, no, there, is, there, there are some distinct entities and roles and risks. And let's, let's get those out on the table and figure out the, way, the right way to, to think about risk management on them. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm encouraged by the fact that that's thematically something that the PWG is focused on. I just think at a high level, if you just take that descriptor, there's just so many devils in the detail and there's so much that has to be considered and worked through. But I think constructive engagement at an industry level uh, and an ecosystem level can kind of ultimately lead to, to good outcomes on that. So let's drill down because you really do tease into the third of the three uh, PWG recommendations, which I'll, I'll quote. To address additional concerns about systemic risk and concentration of economic power, legislation should require stablecoin issuers to comply with activities restrictions that limit affiliations with commercial entities. Supervisors should have authority to implement standards to promote interoperability among stablecoins. In addition, Congress may wish to consider other standards for custodial wallet providers such as limitations on affiliation with commercial entities or on user use of users' transaction data, end quote. So as I read that, there are three recommendations. One, enforce the separation of banking and commerce on stablecoin issuers who now have fallen under the banking side of the banking and commerce ledger, right? right. One of the core problems, as you point out, is the U.S. defines banking and commerce Payments is not part of the bank definition legally right. in the U.S. Right. The, but because banks have dominated payments for so long, it's just simply been assumed. And as fintech unbundles yes. payments, they have been shown to be part of the commercial side of the ledger. So one, 
separating banking and commerce in which Circle would find itself on the bank side. Two, um, uh, the authority to implement standards to promote interoperability among stable coins. I think I heard you say yes to that. Yeah, and I, three- I, I, I Address, yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. And then three, standards for custodial wallet providers, including their affiliation with commercial entities and data usage on consumers. So these are kind of three recommendations in the third. Please go re respond to each of them. Yeah, so if you, if you kind of uh, peek beneath the surface on that, clearly components of this are very specifically directed at the company formerly known as Facebook. Um, and 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 very very clearly directed at that, and I'm sure the the angst and the anxiety that exists with a supranational scale internet entity uh, kind of usurping uh, the fundamental financial market or payment infrastructure that that's obviously provoked a lot of uh, of concern um, in, in in the market, and so I I think pieces of that are are are, are aimed at that. Um, you know, I, I guess um, if, if you kind of break those down, I think the if you accept that um, the the issuance and the kind of administration and operation of a of a of a dollar stablecoin uh, is a banking activity, as we do accept, then being on that side of the ledger, as you say, and the separation of commerce from that, I think that makes sense. Um, I think that that component makes sense. Now, um, I think when you get when you get to the next level down, which is today, um, you know, money transmission law, and 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 in in the United States in particular, and in many other parts of the world, e-money law, uh, payment systems law, all these exist, um, do allow uh, non banks to operate payment systems and to operate payment technologies and to facilitate it. However, the underlying, uh, you know, say core banking, the underlying money itself is not something that's allowed. And so non-banks work with banks um, and, and, you know, circles an example of that today. We work with banks to access the Fedwire system uh, and, and other things, right? So I think that, um, that clearly, and that's where I'd sort of say custodial wallet providers. Like if I'm running a, a payment application and I'm from a technology, if I'm Google and I run Google Pay and that's a payment application and it's a wallet or I'm Robinhood and I have a wallet or I'm Coinbase and I have a wallet or I'm PayPal and I have a wallet, um, those firms should be able to have wallets and operate services that include payment services as part of that. Um, I, I think uh, the, the notion that you would not allow all these different types of firms to compete in that arena would be extraordinarily anti-competitive. I think it would be extraordinarily poor for actual outcomes for society and individuals and others. And so I, 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 I don't think that's what's intended, but if you read it really, really closely, you'd say, no, no, actually, you know, you're, you, you can't be in those businesses necessarily. So that would be like an enormous about face in the face of what has been an extraordinary amount of fintech innovation in the United States. So I, I think, again, devil's in the details when, when you, what are we getting at with this kind of custodial wallet separation of activities thing? Um, and uh, I think an attempt to, uh, in a legislative way, I mean, is it, is it really just a carve out for Facebook? Is this really just an attempt to say, we really don't want Facebook to have anything to do with money at all. And so we're gonna have a law that says if they're dealing with stable coins and, they're, and they have a wallet and they're associated with a commercial non-financial you know, non activity that it's banned. I mean, that's kind of absurd. Um, and, and so again, I think there's like, go beneath the surface, what are you really getting out there um, to, 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 to define that? One possibility is that they're laying groundwork for the adoption of a Federal Reserve digital currency, and then, but don't want to go the following step of allowing people direct access to Federal Reserve accounts, which has been proposed uh, by Morgan Ricks, Lev Menard, some academics, bills on the Hill. There's a lot of energy around Fed accounts. And so they want the wallet intermediary to be a banking 
subsidiary to avoid having the central bank provide its own Fed account as it links to its own central bank digital currency. This is somewhat speculative. Uh, I don't want to get meta in my analysis to use a bad pun and build off of your point. Um, you know, to build off of an earlier point you made about the speed of this, you know, I've done some research on China's payment system mm -hmm. and they leapfrogged our silly cards and swipe fees yeah. and all the rest and just went straight to QR codes yeah. run by Ali and uh, Alipay and WeChat, the Chinese Facebook and Chinese Amazon, and which were way more efficient and faster than the very fed wire you mentioned. Sure. Uh, um, and frankly, d gave great benefits to their consumers. And then the Chinese government is now clawing them yeah. back systemically and introducing a central bank digital currency. Uh, you know, what, what's your view on, 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 all, on, on all of that, on yeah. the CBDC, on this digital wallet question? Sure. What would happen if they took their own regulation and applied it to credit cards and Fed accounts and Visa and all this stuff, as you're kind of pointing yeah. out? I mean, look, there's a lot on this topic and, 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 and we should probably spend a few minutes on it. I think, um, you know, first, I think it's worth noting, laddering off of what you shared about China, which is um, you, you're absolutely correct. The, the, the attempt or the, the explicit activity of creating an ECNY, um, which is not- Electronic Chinese Yuan. Yes, ECN. electronic Chinese Yuan, right? is a direct response to the very significant large scale market power that exists, private market power that exists in payment systems in China. That is, is a direct response and the desire for there to be a third way, uh, a defined public, uh, public option, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and, and I think also very much tied into a, a recentralization of power under an authoritarian regime that seeks to have omniscience uh, and control and to extract value away from the private sector back to the public sector. And we can all talk about that across not just the financial system, other, other areas as well. What I find incredibly, not just, well, disconcerting, frankly, is the, the degree to which policymakers in the West are enamored with what China is doing. And there's almost a, um, you know, how, how do we uh, out China, China? How do we, how do we, how do we out China, China? And I think it's very dangerous in my view, a, 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 what, what may seem fashionable, which is to nationalize infrastructure, put it under government administration and control and government development and, and push to the side, the private sector, I think is extraordinarily dangerous for the West. And it is trying to out China, China. And I think it's very problematic. I think what's interesting about the, the advance of electronic money in the world is that the advance of electronic money in the world has overwhelmingly been through private sector innovation, through consortiums of private sector actors building new form factors, you know, new, new technological form factors. Um, and building standards and interoperability and driving that at scale, whether it's the international wire messaging system, the advent of, of mag stripes and card readers, and, and eventually the ledger systems that supported what we think of as the first real scaled form of electronic money to, to more common advancements that we know of today, like PayPal and Apple Pay and things like that. And this is around the world. And the private sector has played an enormous role, not only in payment system innovation has played this incredibly enormous role in the issuance of, of money itself, right? The, the, the vast majority of electronic money we deal with today is privately issued money. It's not public money. It's privately issued money, regulated privately issued money. Um, but I think where I'm going with this is simply to say there's a set of, I think, ideals, which I think are actually enshrined in the internet itself ideals of openness, of free competition, of open intellectual property, uh, of decentralization as, as, a, as a value, something that, that is pushes power and, 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 and creativity and other things out uh, further. Those are values and, and those are values in the internet. And I think Western liberal market democratic and, and, and similar ideals have, 
have actually given rise to a, an incredible amount, not just in market economies, but also in, in, in what the internet is for us today. And I actually look at technologies like stable coins and public blockchains and the smart contracts and all the stuff that's happening there as incredible and beautiful examples of what happens when you embrace that set of values uh, of, of openness, of, of open intellectual property, of decentralization, and, and of private sector innovation. And I don't think we want to miss out on that because that's happening at a really fast pace. It's happening at an incredibly fast pace. And I think the importance of the PWG report is it's, it's acknowledging that what's happening on the open internet and what's happening in the private sector is growing really fast and it's gonna get even bigger. And it is something that needs to be regulated. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, I also like to point out is people sort of say we're behind China on this. Actually, it's absolutely, absolutely the opposite. We are way ahead of China. China's got a beta test of a government controlled thing that's had tens of millions of RMB, uh, tens of billions of RMB of transactions. I think there's like $5 trillion of stablecoin dollar, dollar, US dollar stablecoin transactions. And it's growing like crazy and tons of companies are connecting to it. And so we're actually winning. The West is winning the digital currency space race right now. Oh, so so it's, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, you'll find no bigger uh, 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 proponent of the failure or, or, or argue the failure of the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government to make money move faster in the United States for people. I mean, the scariest part about Halloween for me is if you deposited a payment on Friday in your bank account, October 29th, it wasn't available until Tuesday, November 2nd. Right. Uh, and right. you know, They're using that uh, cryptocurrency, you know, it's uh, 400 milliseconds and it doesn't cost you a penny. That's right. Right. Instead, it costs billions of dollars in $35 overdraft fees, in check cashing fees. 70%, my research has shown 70% of check casher yeah. customers have bank accounts in the US because the bank, US banking system fails to yeah. work for them. And decades of Federal Reserve studying of faster payments has led to very little. Uh, benefit as the very banks the Federal Reserve and the OCC regulates make tens of billions of dollars in fees off of that same product. And there's a very real tension sure. between the central bank as a payment operator and a payment regulator and a bank regulator. But I can't let you off the hook, Jeremy, because you talk about all these great innovations. And, and I, I see a lot of that point. Uh, but there's some pretty big spectacular failures that occur in this caveat emptor private world. Totally. Uh, you know, the, the largest stable coin issuer, Tether, has recently had a $1 million bounty placed on it by a private short seller saying, show us your assets that back this coin. I know you guys have put out uh, statements written by uh, uh, in response to that. And then people have quibbled with your statements, your definition of commercial paper, how fully dollar denominated backed you are. You know, I don't know if you want to discuss the million dollar bounty on Tether, or if you want to answer a question that says something to the effect of, if every stable coin issuer had to reveal where their money was, are you confident that every single one of them on a platform today would be fully dollar reserved? Or do you think that if you open that kimono behind or, or peer behind that curtain, you would find several stable coin issuers who are not being fully transparent and for whom Absolutely. there could be real risks to their users? Absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why USDC is regulated and supervised by banking regulators under the same laws that supervise the balances you hold at PayPal or with Apple or with Square, which is a full reserve, one for one redeemability with consumer protection laws that protect you from insolvency, that specifically supervise on compliance, any money laundering, information security standards, all these things. Those things have applied to us since day one. And those statutes exist so that people have confidence in these electronic payment systems. And I think that's really important. There are absolutely other stablecoin issuers who ignore that entirely and who we don't know the answer. Um, and, and so I think what it speaks to is in the United States for firms that are domiciled in the United States that are operating in the stablecoin space, 
we're all under these regulations and we've been under those uh, since day one. Now, I think there, there are sort of philosophical discussions of what is the appropriate liquidity on, an, on a stored value electronic money instrument? Is it cash to cash equivalents or, or is it something outside of that? The regulators in the United States who, who supervise all of the major fintechs out there have differing definitions of, of what is permissible for those underlying dollar denominated assets that, that, are, that need to be liquid for users for these payment systems. There are different definitions. Um, we've based on market feedback, and based on really where we see things going at a federal level and, and from a ultimately bank charter level, we, we've opted for the most conservative uh, position possible there. But it's all under a regulatory framework. It's not like we're just making these decisions in, in a vacuum. We have to do it. Well, but let me, let, me, let me push back on this regulatory framework, right? Bernie Madoff operated in a regulatory framework. I think he was even elected to you know, strong roles of self-governing and self-regulatory operations. Uh, a lot of people have compared stable coins to money market mutual funds. Actually, one of the shortcomings I found of the PWG report is they don't even mention money market mutual funds in the entire report, right? It, I, I kind of read the thing and go, wow, I can't wait till these guys find out that there's a multi-trillion dollar business called money market mutual funds. What are they going to think of how they are regulated, right? Because they're, they're promising, in essence, a one-to-one, -one, you can't lose money, but we'll give you interest. Well, there's a, there, yeah, I mean, clearly if you're offering an investment contract where you're saying to someone, in, invest your dollars and I will hold them and give you a return, that's an investment contract and that's a security and that's pretty clear. Um, I think when you have a balance with PayPal or you store value in a USDC uh, digital currency or you're using Apple Pay cash or well, cash, I, I, I mean, you're... You're, you're not making an investment in that case. You're not looking at the investment and the return on that investment and so on. And that's why money transmission law and, and the statutes around that exist. And, you know, I mean, I think if you're questioning whether the state of New York and California and Texas are effective examiners uh, and the, the other statute, statutory, you know, uh, 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 you know, fiduciaries that are involved in, in supervising these regulated financial institutions are not effective. That's a different question. So no, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asking, I'm asking a, a different question. I'm going to ask a question because this kind of came up uh, uh, in terms of, of a paper, Tim Massad, who was the chairman of the CFTC, yep. another market regulator. And we published his paper on stable coins in Brookings. And Tim writes, quote, Although I have compared stable coin risk to those of money market mutual funds, I do not think that is the best way to regulate them. They are fundamentally payment devices and not investments. Classifying them as securities would also appear to preempt a systemic importance determination as part of the payment authority given under the Dodd-Frank law that talks about the definition of payment settlement and clearing activity for purposes of, of um, uh, he goes on to, to, to write, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing him here, that the Financial Stability Oversight Committee, the so-called Jedi Mind Council sure. of bank regulators, who interestingly did not put out this report, even though a majority of their members did under a different organization, you can guess which ones weren't included in, in going under A versus B, but the FSOC has an authority and the PWG report talks about their authority to do designations. Tim is making the argument that these are not money market, that you're not really an investment vehicle and shouldn't be treated like that. And I would contrast him, the question that came in from the audience, which is, do you agree, and you can hashtag stablecoin uh, to ask your own question on this. And it's a, do you agree with uh, SEC Chairman Gensler's comments that a majority of stable coins are securities and thus under SEC jurisdiction? So you have Mossad over here saying that analogously, you're offering something, there's an analogy to money market mutual funds, particularly as it relates to run risk. And then over here, you have the SEC chairman who has jurisdiction over money market mutual funds, uh, arguing that most of your issuances do fall under them under current law. Where do you fall on this? I mean, look, th there are actually hundreds of different stablecoin projects out in, in the digital assets world. Um, and there are stable coins issued by financial institutions in Indonesia, in Europe, in, um, you know, in, in uh, 
Brazil, you know, in, in a lot of markets. So there are a lot of, uh, of stable coins. There are many stable coins that are issued algorithmically by software that are, that are collateralized with different crypto assets, uh, that there is no corporate issue where there's just software. So, so there's a huge range of things that are out there. I think, um, and, and I don't profess to be an expert on each and every one of those in all the different jurisdictions in which those are issued. Uh, if a financial institution's got uh, authority from the payment and, and electronic money regulators in Indonesia to launch a rupee token, I would say that's an Indonesian matter. Now, if you're issuing something that is asset backed in the United States, that is um, providing a, a dollar payment technology, you are either operating under the laws that exist on electronic money and payment systems in the United States, or you're not. Um, and so I think the first question is not, you know, are these securities or not? I think the first question is, is are these legally operating under the regulatory framework that we have in place today for payment technologies? Um, now, are there potentially stable coins, dollar referenced stable coins that are conducting investment uh, products uh, in some way, um, you know, that's an open question as well. Um, I, I, again, I don't profess to be a, an expert on every single uh, project that, that is out there. Um, I, what I would say is, a, you know, a, um, you know, a, a dollar referenced uh, dollar asset backed stable coin that is trying to operate within a compliant framework that exists in the United States today, and is say backed by Bitcoin loans and obligations would not survive the statutory treatments that exist for 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 money transmission in the United States. They wouldn't. They they would they would be outside of that. Um, so I mean, look, I, I I think very clearly, you know, there's a reason why the the good actors and the regulated players in the United States have been operating under well defined you know well defined statutes and payment systems uh, since, since day one. It's to me the really the you know the, there may be stable coins that, that are, you know, backed by uh, baskets of securities. There may be stable coins that are pegged to stocks and bonds and other things that are stable against the reference price of a stock. Those things probably are securities. They look a lot like securities. So I think there are clearly things that you could, you could put over there in the dollar stable coin space, um, you know, and, and certainly the, the space that we've been operating in for years now, um, you know, I think it's pretty cut and dry. Uh, what these things are. So, so let's talk a little bit more about stable coins because we only have a little over 10 minutes left. Talk a little bit about what your company is doing and talk a little bit about some of the innovation and, and, and potential that you have to be more inclusive. I kind of, you know, note that money market mutual funds who pose a lot of the same run risk that the PWG report is so hyper-conscious of have been bailed out in each of the last two recessions by the Federal Reserve. And that, you know, it doesn't escape my attention that the, I mean, a staggering amount of money market mutual fund investors are old and white. And they get bailed out repeatedly hmm. in crises. Stable coins, it's hard to know who's in them to be to some degree. I'd love to know what information you guys have. My own observation seemed to be that they skew younger than money market mutual funds. And the correlation with age and race in this country is astounding as well. Uh, one of my favorite new statistics has to do with modal age. And most people, when they remember stats, remember mean, median, and mode, but we only ever talk about mean, average, or median, middle. We don't talk about mode the most frequent. But if you put all white people in America in a room and you lined up by age and birth year, there'd be more people under the queue of 57 years old than any other age. If you did the same for African-Americans, it would be 27. If you did the same for Latinos, it would be 11. Younger people are far browner than older people. And if you believe younger people are more into cryptocurrency, trading assets, have Coinbase accounts or other digital wallets are dealing in Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Tether, Circle, whatever, uh, which is certainly my belief. And there's some, there's some data to support that, although data is difficult to come by in this space. 
Um, you can't help but notice that this is a younger crowd, inherently more racially diverse. Uh, talk a little bit about how that is and talk about, you know, what would just, you know, what uh, lessons, if any, of regulators learned from their decision repeatedly to bail out money market mutual funds in the form of a crisis or a run? And what might happen, you know, if there were a crisis in the run in stable coins? Would money market, would regulators treat them the same as money market mutual funds? Uh, uh, and, and so talk a little bit about that and, you know, take a moment. I realize we've delved straight into the policy as a bit of a policy nerd and wonk. I haven't given you a moment to breathe and talk a little bit about the company and sure. who you guys are reaching and what you're doing. So it's, it's a little bit of a grab bag to respond to here towards the end, but there's some. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Aaron. I, I, you know, I, I would start, you know, with a, a, a couple of kind of high level thoughts on this. I'm going to, I'll, I'll separate out the, the, the bailout question for, for a moment. Um, and cause I do think it kind of connects back to the earlier discussion very, very clearly, but um, you know, I think our view and, and really, you know, I, I helped found this uh, over eight years ago. And I think the insight that we had when we were starting this was that, um, you know, this new technology of, of, of cryptographic money and of these public internet, you know, transaction and, 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 and other networks, these blockchain networks, we had the insight that those could over time, once they became um, scalable enough, meaning they could handle a lot more transactions, and once they became what I call extensible, meaning like you could uh, not just have a Bitcoin, but you could have other referenceable assets and you could write code that, you know, automated transactions around them, smart contracts, things like this, that that would give, uh, give way to and, and, and ultimately get to a, a point where we could have protocols for money on the Internet, just like we have protocols for information and communications and data on the Internet. And that that could work at internet scale. And that once that worked at internet scale, once you had, you know, as I call it, the HTTP of money, right? HTTP is the protocol that is the, the web and how we, how we do this. Once you have that, then that would unlock an incredible amount, right? It would, in our view, um, ultimately bring the cost of storing and moving value to zero, just like the cost of storing and moving data is effectively zero for, for almost any person or business today. Um, it would, it would open up the reach uh, to anyone in the world that could connect to the internet. Um, and it would, it would bring those costs down. Now, we're on our way there. We're, we're eight years into the journey. The technology to make that possible is really arriving now. We think in the next two to three years, it will be at a point where a billion plus people uh, could interact with it uh, you know, safely and easily on the internet. Uh, or more. And that has incredible potential to obviously, from a financial inclusion perspective, be extraordinarily powerful, but also just returning value to the real economy in terms of the taxes and time delays and other things that go on with money today. And then more importantly, we, we don't exist in a, in a domestic context only. We exist in a global context. Everything we do happens in this global context and commerce itself, as we're seeing with supply shortages and other interdependencies in the global economy, commerce itself, internet native commerce, all of this is just growing and growing. And we need a new economic infrastructure that is built on the internet in this, in this age to do that. And, and I believe that digital currency and blockchains provide for that. And I think that that's going to that's going to lead to i think very very significant significant innovations in the the nature of of commerce on the internet um and that will be value creating for the the, the firms and the and the users and the individuals and the households and others around the world so i i really believe that this is contributing to something much much larger and um you know we're we're, we're making good progress there and i think if one say looks at this narrowly through the lens of payment systems, I think it's actually missing the picture because in our view, it would be, um, it would be like trying to look at the internet through the lens of long distance telephone providers, which is maybe what people did in the early days of the internet. It's not, that's not a helpful way to think about what the internet did for communications. And I think similarly, 
if you're looking at this narrowly through the lens of payment systems, you're missing the picture of a fabric of commerce and financial activity that can happen intermediated on the internet in these new ways. So I, I think um, that's what I think is at stake. I, and, and, and actually just coming back to the policy side for a moment, um, I think this is like fundamental national economic competitiveness stuff. And I think one of the really important missing pieces of the policy discussion, it's all been about the risks, the run risks, the, the financial crime risks, which are real and those are real. So we have to deal with them. But we've got other risks, which are economic competitiveness risks, national security risks, and national security and economic competitiveness are kind of two sides of the same coin in some respects. And how does the United States ensure that the dollar and, and, and dollar digital currency and the economic infrastructure of blockchains, which are a profound innovation, how does it ensure that, that the United States is leading and advancing that? Because that's in the interest of the country and that's in the interest of, 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 of the households and firms within the country. And so I, I feel like there's, there, we need to really start to shape the, the debate a little bit to how do we take advantage of all this infrastructure that's happening and support it and build on it and make the United States a champion for this advancement. Um, and, um, and, and so there's just, there's more work to do, you know, to, to, to educate on all of that. There's a huge mistake policymakers are making, right? Millions of children went hungry when the COVID economy shut down. Congress responded radically quickly by authorizing initial stimulus payments by the end of March. They, Congress passed a law putting 1500 bucks out there before the unemployment numbers were even released. There are a bunch of people that want automatic policy and just let the stabilizers work. Right. And they don't realize Congress authorized the money before even the data were available, right? Because common sense showed you that March 31 was nothing like March 1. Right. And their children starving. Yeah. And guess how long it took those that money in a pandemic emergency to reach people, right? Nobody yeah. got money before April 15th. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. Millions of people didn't get their money till September. Yeah. Right? So this isn't just about economic competitiveness. Now, how many policymakers' children went hungry? Right. How many people, you know, watching this webcast's children went hungry? We just assumed the money was coming. To this day, the child tax credit, one out of eight families is waiting on a paper check. Yeah. This is the single biggest way to alleviate child poverty in America. And the U.S. Treasury Department is sending paper checks yeah. in the mail. Well, you know, I, I agree with you. Experience. Wholeheartedly agree with you. And this is clearly a public-private sector opportunity, Right. Uh, not just a public sector opportunity. It's a it's an opportunity, you know, for, right. for, for for advancement in the private sector in support of these public policy objectives. But but I wish I wish the federal government, I wish the U.S. Treasury Department would contract with anybody that wasn't the Federal Reserve because the Fed can't get you their money any faster. Right. Right. There are all these ways to get the money faster. Yeah. Right. But we don't. We refuse to. It isn't a public private. It's a it's a it's a public public public. Right. And so. You know, and listen, I'm all for a public system. If we could have built a better system and had a better system, the UK has a better system. Singapore got their money out the same afternoon in an hour, right? It's not as if this technology doesn't exist or that only the private sector knows how to implement real-time payments. To the yeah, contrary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Jeremy, we're coming up to the very, very last minute. So last question in closing, I want to ask you because You've had, you know, look, I have to give my hat off to you. Eight years ago, you came up with this idea and you founded this company. And I don't think anybody would have credibly thought that eight years later, uh, there'd be the president's working group on financial markets dedicating a report to the issuance of stable coins and, 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 and all of this. Give me eight years in the future. You know, what, what, what is going to be the real change if this system is well regulated? And allowed to advance. So, yeah. get, you know, because uh, uh, you can you can see a mistake in either direction you've laid out. It yeah. can be overly regulated, it can be underly regulated. Yeah, yeah. So uh, equilibrium, it, it's well regulated and, and can achieve mainstream scale. 
I, I mean, look, I, I, I think there are a number of things. I think one is that uh, the, 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 the cost of, of moving money just becomes zero. And that means the cost of receiving a payment as a business, a small business, a merchant goes to zero. It means the ability to transact internationally costs go, approach zero and have the speed and convenience of the internet. Uh, just like we take it, we take for granted that we can have a video call with anyone anywhere at no cost. We will take for granted that just value moves in that way, in that same kind of way. That's I think very significant. I think uh, uh, you know a you know a, a second piece is that um, in particular as we think about the internationalization of this technology, it will become you know just as seamless as we send an email or a text message and we don't think about what country someone is in, right? As I like to say, what's the, when's the last time that you sent a cross-border email? The concept is just absurd, right? Will be an anachronism and, 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 and will we'll seem silly, right? It'll be like, well, it's just the internet, right? Um, so I think things like that will occur. I think the more um, dramatic things though are gonna come from the ability to take advantage of what is often referred to as the programmability of money. Once money in the form of dollars or euros, but let's just talk about dollars for the moment, actually becomes a native type of data on the internet that can be programmed with contracts. And those contracts can be executed and enforced by machines on the internet, AKA smart contracts. Once you develop that at scale, I believe it can lead to very significant transformations in what we think of as capital markets activity, in access to uh, credit, in the, the provisioning of, of lending uh, on a global basis. I think that that will lead to not just more efficiencies and, and a lower cost, but it will lead to more access to these types of financial services for firms and households all around the world. And so I think there's deeper things that can happen with the nature of capital markets and, 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 and what is what we think of as commercial banking and things like that today can shift into this and, and bring the kind of internet scale, unit economic benefits and access benefits that we've seen in so many other industries, you can bring that into finance. And so I think we can see strong, strong progress towards those in the next eight years. Well, some of those sound very exciting to me, particularly the allocation of credit on a much smarter system than, exactly. you know, did you get did you did you get uh, divorced or have a medical emergency six years ago, dinging your right. made up three digit FICO score that's made up to look like an SAT to pretend right. like it's relevant. Right. On the other hand, I'm I'm terrified about zero transaction costs because then how am I going to get my credit card rewards? Well, uh, there's we plenty of ways to build data. incentives and, and, and loyalty. Those aren't necessarily tied to that. No, but, I mean, those, those are mostly currently come out of large swipe fees paid by merchants and lower income people. Yeah, no, cash, absolutely. Right? So I, I think, um, again, the nature of affinity and loyalty and how that's operationalized, there's plenty of room for innovation in that. That goes beyond what we think of as, you know, these, these, these swipe fees and other things. I think crypto technology actually can be a, a pretty important piece of that as well. Well, that's a perfect note to end and, and maybe bring you back for a second uh, conversation on that because I'm really interested in that in the in the future. So I just want to thank you very much, uh, you. Jeremy Allaire, the CEO of, of Circle, for joining us today. And thank you all and wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.